Um, yeah, so I was a claims manager, as I said, <clears throat> in the world of site finished hardwood flooring. And so I learned a lot about all the challenges associated with that one market segment of flooring. Uh, you know, don't ask me too much about carpet. I never sold it. I've only ever really walked on it. So um, like I say, we all come from our areas of, of, uh, of the industry. So there's gonna be folks on this call who um, know plenty of stuff. And if you feel this to uh, a topic pops up that is uh, speaks to you, you have a story about something that is of interest, please share it um, this way um, as a group around around the table maybe we get a little bit closer to knowing everything about everything we can learn from each other so yeah as a claims manager not only did i learn the uh, challenges associated with site finished flooring and how you know if it wasn't a fly in the finish it was um, a freshly coated floor got the mailman and sticking mail through the letterbox and that sticking in the finish i i every day three complaints came back um uh and so i learned not only to deal with the complaints but to manage the people that were angry with us because they expected the process to just go smoothly and perfect. Expectations are everything. Um, so yeah, we've seen all seen this site. If we're if we're in the world of claims management, um, this is basically the homeowner saying, "I'm prepared to do battle with you, Mister Dealer. Um, so come and tell me why my floor is doing whatever it's doing." Is there a problem in our industry, <clears throat> the flooring industry in general? I'd say absolutely there is. Um, you know, around $36 billion worth of flooring gets sold in the US every year. That was the last stat I saw put out by a recognized and respected publication. Um, and around 30 billion square feet of flooring is, is installed. Um, so it's a massive, massive industry that we're in. And it, it flies by the seat of its pants. <clears throat> Now, when I say, is there a problem? Um, if we look at the manufacturers that supply us product, um, a lot of those manufacturers will tell you they put aside somewhere between one and 2% of gross sales just to deal with claims. So if you're a billion dollar manufacturer and there's plenty of them out there, um, I could reel off several just at the top of my head, but uh, and some a good deal bigger than a billion, more like five, six, seven billion. Um, if you're a billion dollar, gross sales company, then you're putting aside one point, uh, sorry, $15 million worth of, of gross sales uh, or dollars to deal with claims. Now, <clears throat> claims come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, giving a few boxes as a goodwill gesture uh, to, to keep the relationship going with the dealer. Um, maybe it's a full rip out but uh, there's all sorts of reasons that we deal with, with claims. But you can see there that there's significant numbers. Now, if you want to affect your bottom line in business, you're going to do it one of two ways. You're either going to increase your price or you're going to reduce your costs. So we're all subject to this claims figure at some level. So if we can somehow, you know, learn to do a better job when it comes to claims, maybe we'll save off the bottom line uh, and increase our margins a bit. Diminished skilled labor pool, <clears throat> that is the buzz topic at the moment. It's only getting worse. Um, the figure I heard from uh, on, on CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, uh, the other day was 20% of uh, trades are expected to retire in the next five years. So if you've got a crew of five, you're going to lose one of them. Um, and, it's, and they're not replaceable. And so now you're talking about that's the bigger picture. That's the constructor is thinking about that. When it comes down to flooring, we're just one skilled trade out of many. And we're, we're seen as a difficult trade as well. It's not like we're electrical or, I mean, they all come with their challenges, but flooring isn't necessarily the most desirable trade to uh, to get involved with. So we've got to remarket our trade and uh, make sure that we're at least in front of the audience that might uh, think about coming into the trades and think about being a floor cover in the future. Lots of work in that department is being done in the background. There is a, a lack of education, there's a lack of organization uh, when it comes to education. You know, we've got, we're all attending education right now, but uh, there needs to be a, a lot more, not just installers, but sales people, um, not just dealers, sailors, sales people, but manufacturers, sales reps. It's a, um, 
high turnover role. There's uh, it's a revolving door of new people coming in, old people retiring, um, newbies coming in and getting a baptism by fire and hoping for the best and causing no end of problems. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit as we go through the presentation. <clears throat> always a new product on on uh, in the mix, always something being reinvented and supposed to be dealt with a little bit differently. So how we stay up with that, I don't know. Just uh, you got to make sure you're close to the manufacturer's reps and make sure your uh, reps know what they're talking about when it comes to uh, information on their product. Um, fast track construction is only getting faster. You know, if I'm a builder and I borrowed money five years ago to build my multifamily um, project, uh, then the cost of the, uh, the borrowed money is a hell of a lot more today than it was five years ago, depending on how, how these things roll out. But you better believe that, um, if anything, the, the deadline is going to be brought forward to uh, to offset that, that expense. So for us, as the last skilled trade in the building, apart from the, the painter maybe, but seriously, who cares about the painter? He's dealing with the walls. Flooring, we take over the whole space and no one can work on it while we do. So we're pretty, we're a significant consideration for uh, the constructor to get right to to make sure that things are ready um, for us, the floor covering trade, when we show up so that we don't send a crew of five people to install 5,000 feet in three days and end up saying, well, you don't have your windows in, you don't have your heat on, slabs not flat, so we're out of here and we'll see you in, I don't know, next next time on our schedule is like in a month's time. So what's going to happen to the builder when he hears that? He's going to threaten you with no payment and all sorts of stuff. It gets ugly fast. So. Uh, training critical and uh, understanding that fast track construction is not getting any slower anytime soon. And specifications. If you're selling a product, you become the specifier. Um, we see specifications in uh, in architectural documents often that don't make too much sense. Cut and paste um, causes no end of problems uh, at the end of you know when it's uh, for the boots on the ground, if you will. But uh, importantly. Consider yourself as a salesperson for a dealership. You're specifying the product. You've got to dig deep into the mind of the homeowner who's coming to your shop and ask good questions. What are you going to be using this, this floor for? Where will it be? Uh, where do you want it installed? Um, how many kids do you take your shoes off when you come into the house? All this sort of stuff. Um, and then you can stand a chance of uh, specifying correctly. Complaint categories. Well, there's all sorts of things that start off complaints. Um, you know, there's that saying, uh, nothing happens till someone sells something. And the thing is, when something is sold, is it going to go off in the right direction or is it going to go off in the wrong direction? Um, I think we all know what uh, I mean by that. So we're going to go through a few of the complaint categories uh, later in this presentation. We're also going to look at prep. Uh, two types of prep, um, the uh, surface prep, we're all very familiar with arguing about. Who's going to prep the uh, the, un, uh, the, uh, the rough and out of shape concrete slab? Um, that's one side of prep. The other side of prep is everything else that needs to be done before you ship wood flooring to site. So how's it going to acclimate on site? All that sort of stuff. We'll talk about that later. Installation, that's, uh, that's an obvious one. Maintenance. That's an obvious one. And manufacturing, we'll look at, cover, uh, at a couple of examples of where the manufacturer's product actually does fail. Yes, that actually does happen out there. It's not all the installer's fault. So resources and industry standards first. So there's uh, lots of good stuff to support you in the world of complaints. If you are that complaint manager like me, I, like, like I was back in the day, um, standards are very important. Here's a, a, a great example. Um, ANSI, the uh, American national standard, in this case for engineered wood flooring, is, is uh, a great resource. <laughs> I'm going to give you an example of how I use that in a few slides time. Um, but what I like about standards like this, um, also we, uh, we have ASTM. Um, we also have uh, uh, Carpet and Rug Institute both uh, 
commercial carpet and residential carpet, CRI 104 and 105. If, if you don't have copies of those and you're installing carpet, you can get them online for free. Just Google CRI 104, 105. Um, NWFA, fantastic. The granddaddy of, uh, of the wood flooring industry. I've, you know, having sold wood for years, um, always re referring to their great publications, very uh, thoughtful and intelligent documents. Um, and with their new wood flooring installation guidelines, as an inspector myself, I use uh, that reference material all the time. It allows me as an inspector to be definitive in my conclusions, which helps the um, warring parties out there to make decisions. I mean, that that uh, finger of blame that's swinging back and forth has to land somewhere, unfortunately. But it's, if it's going to land on you, what you want as a to know as a company is am i actually to blame for this and if i am then as the rep i can take that to my boss and say you know what i think that uh, this we have to own this it's a lot easier for a good company with good intentions then to step up and look after the problem but if it's ambiguous and gray areas with no definitive conclusions and no standards it gets left as just an argument and everybody trying to dodge the finger of blame so now for is uh, looking after the laminate Flooring World, North American Laminate Flooring Association. They're at uh, nalfa.com. You don't know those guys? And our organization, National Floor Covering Association of Canada, has uh, what we call the Floor Covering Reference Manual. Um, this is a great document uh, for getting specified into construction projects. Once we get it specified and the language pops up, there's something as simple as do the floor coverings according to NFCA floor covering reference manual. That'll, that'll appear in your flooring spec if you're bidding on commercial work. Now, all of the mid minimum industry standards that we all know um, and that basically reflect what the manufacturers require for a successful installation are included in the specifications on that project. That means they're contractually binding. The general contractor will have bid on that work with that language in it, and therefore he has to comply. <clears throat> and so, you know, in, uh, wrapped up in that service is an inspection service that we we offer, where we actually send an inspector to site to work with the construction team before, during, and after the uh, the installation. And we are a resource to all involved. And uh, one of the first things we tell the construction team is we are not here to represent the P word perfect. There's no such thing in construction, but we are here to represent comp competency and minimum industry standards, something that most of the dealers in uh, in our purview are exceeding, easily exceeding. So uh, once we get that across to the builder, um, and we, we're there now, I mean, I spent the first 10 years of, uh, well, we've been doing this for 11 years now. I spent the first five or six years getting, getting, um, uh, a lot of flack and pushback, quite frankly. I should be bald and in a straitjacket, but now um, the last five years, I would say have been uh, builders coming to us to say, yeah, this is good information. How can how can you help us to understand better what the floor guy needs? Because if he arrives on site three weeks from deadline or rejects the slab, it's not good for anybody. So, and we want to avoid those conversations where the floor guy is being forced or, or told to um, take shortcuts. That's, I don't care. Just get it done. Um, we see that happening all the time. If you're a floor coverer who has ever knowingly said, OK, I'll buckle. I'll do what my good customer, the GC, says to do just because I'm trying to help and I want the next job and I want to maintain this relationship. And you go in and the windows aren't even installed and you put the floor down and it fails. Who do you think is going to be held responsible? You, the skilled trade, will be held responsible. So think about it. In our manual, uh, very quickly, resilient flooring, carpet, hardwood, laminate, cork, bamboo. We don't do tile, stone, uh, marble, all that stuff. That's a different uh, organization, TTMAC in Canada. They do a great job on their side of the flooring industry and we on ours. Uh, in the manual, what I liked is, number one, it issues or it, it delivers definitive uh, verbiage for who is responsible for what on site. When the spec says do the floor covering uh, uh, installed floor coverings according to NFCA floor covering reference manual standards, that means that the flooring contractor does not have to take relative humidity in situ drill tests according to ASTM 2170 as one example of many. 
Your job is not to have to flatten or correct concrete. It has nothing to do with our trade. It's a separate trade. You're expected, like the painter, to go in, <clears throat> like the painter would expect to go in and not have to fix the tape, uh, the uh, tape and the mud and the drywall. Well, floor covers don't expect to go in and fix concrete surfaces. We uh, assume uh, and are expected to be provided a workable surface that we pretty much just come in, scratch coat and, and trowel out the adhesive and get going. So that's all very, that's what I liked about this manual when, when we started pushing it. Uh, it's brilliantly written by a lot smarter people than me, that's for sure. Um, I think there are around 40 people involved in putting it together. So a great resource. <clears throat> Other resources out there are materials testing. You know, if you're caught up trying to figure out whether it's the installation or whether it's the materials, then here's two independent laboratories, Intertech Canada and out of the US Professional Testing Labs. Uh, these guys in the US are brilliant at what they do, love their service. Um, you know, they have a website, they post a lot of, the, the, of their um, costs or prices for their testing. And they really, I think, are the hub for, for example, LVT, LVP will be sent to this um, organization for testing of various types, wood flooring. Um, anyway, so if you have any questions about those guys, uh, you can just Google them. They're in Dalton, Georgia, and they know their stuff. Another resource, inspector certification. There are independent inspection agencies across the country, across North America. Um, I, I would have to hazard a guess at about 150 to 200 in Canada. NFCA, we assign uh, inspectors, independent inspectors to, to um, files or, or projects where there's a dispute going on. We only use 12 inspectors, um, roughly two from each province with any population. Um, they're very good at what they do. Uh, you know, uh, we've, you know, we've got great resources behind the scenes. If I, I get asked questions all the time and many of them I don't know how to, how to answer. So I, but I do have uh, a Cardex full of numbers with very smart people who can help me uh, help the, the people that phone in. So some of them are these inspectors. So <clears throat> they've been trained by folks like CFIU, FCITS, ITS. Um, you don't learn to be a good inspector in a week or two week course. Absolutely not. You've got to be th you've got to bring three things to the table before you go and get certified. One is a deep, deep understanding of floor coverings. And, you know, some people have a deep, deep understanding of hardwood, nothing about carpet. That would be me. Um, others, uh, you know, everyone has their strengths. So that's one thing. Deep understanding of floor coverings. Number two, be able to write articulately and get your message across in a written report. And the third is be able to keep your mouth shut on site. The last thing you want to do is guess at conclusions. You go there and you gather the facts, you take them back to base, you cross-reference, you write your report, and you let the report do your thinking. That is our mandate. That is our message to the inspectors that we work with. And we are, the other, <clears throat> the other saying that we keep repeating is, um, we are all about what's right, not who's right. So if you are a floor cover who's done the wrong thing, don't call us for an inspection. It won't go well for you um, and vice versa. Builders too, we're just there to protect the truth or issue the truth. So here's a, an example of a, an inspection that I did. Um, this is a hardwood floor, clearly has an overwood issue. Um, if you are uh, a, a sales rep, and you're coming into this environment, how are you expected to know whether that's acceptable or not? It kind of feels like and looks like it's not acceptable, but if you say that to the manufacturer that that's not acceptable, they're going to say, well, prove it. And they'd be kind of right to do that. But when we have standards in place that are generally under, uh, that are recognized uh, um, by uh, recognized bodies like ANSI, like NWFA, uh, their involvement can become very powerful, very useful. So in this case, <clears throat> this is around, I don't know, what was it, four or 5,000 square feet. The, uh, when I got there, the, the homeowner started um, talking away and I said, look, I'm not here to get the whole story. I just want you to show me your concerns. And she took me to this uh, area and I started to measure the flooring and, and the issues that she pointed out. The installer was there and he was, he was so fried and frustrated. It was interesting. He, I said, I've, I've been trying to install this floor 
it's a glue down floor. I'm covered in Bostic best now. And every time I put a board in, I had to take it out and then replace it. Um, very frustrating. So I just gave up and I said, well, it's a good job you did because you're supposed to stop if you see anything wrong with the floor. You got to give the manufacturer a chance to come out and uh, and take the flooring back. They won't do that if you've opened up every pack. So um, long and short of it is, here's my measuring tool, feeler gauges, mechanics feeler gauges, and those two numbers add up to 0 0.033 of an inch in the imperial system. Um, for this uh, slide, we're going to look at the metric system. So there you can see uh, that overwood is just less than one millimeter high. It looks higher than that because the photograph is, is very close up, but it's actually 0.84 of a millimeter. When I go to the ANSI standard, and everybody has access to this. So if you're a manufacturer and you want to manage your own stuff, uh, you're a dealer and you want to know whether you have a problem on site, you can go get this information. You don't need an inspector to do it. But here are the important things relative to this case. Characteristics of the flooring. This is, uh, the, by the way, the engineered wood uh, standard that ANSI has issued. Factory finished, bevel edged, that's what it is. And there's the overwood maximum limit is 0.31 of a millimeter. So if we go back and look at what we had, there's a third of a millimeter. And what we have is 0.84. So it's almost three times over the, over the limit. So that's great. That, that allows me to be definitive in my conclusions. Um, for, a, uh, for a sales rep, you're not expected to know that. You should be uh, managed accordingly. But you can go in, take photographs and gather the data and pass it on to a tech rep or back to the manufacturer, if it depends on who's on site looking at it, um, and then be of use. But it must be very stressful if there's no um, policy in place, for example, for a manufacturer's uh, rep who gets called by an angry dealer, get to site your products, garbage, whatever it is, and, and somehow be left in this, do I have to find out what's going on? Do I have to have the answers when I get there? That's not a pleasant place to be. So um, we're gonna look at company policy and what maybe that should look like. Any questions about that last case? I'm trying to encourage you. I mean, if you want to ask, I'd rather you ask actually, let's have a conversation. Then you just gotta take the mute off. Yeah. Chris, hey, Gavin. What would, what would be an expected time frame? Because obviously in that last example the house is torn apart the um, consumers in a bit of a fit and everybody's pushing for a very fast answer is there an expected time frame or is that each case individual each case individual and it's uh you know in all cases homeowner has set this ball rolling by either building a new house or renovating their existing house it's their fault ultimately that all this activity is now happening in their in their home so buyer beware is a is a real statement. And so they can't suddenly say, well, you know, now I need, unless unless they've written it into the contract and you've signed the contract, uh, they can't beat you up about that. It's a, it's a reasonable expectation that uh, time is going to be required. Uh, in this case, the material had to be assessed by the manufacturer. The material went back to the manufacturer. They accepted it. And uh, I, I don't know what happened after that, probably replaced. Um, and that would have taken, you know, probably a couple of weeks by the time the flooring that was put in was ripped out and replaced and all that sort of uh, back and forth. Um, that house was a brand new build. And so there was uh, not quite the um, uh, push to get it done. Uh, you know, if the homeowner is living out of their home in a rented accommodation or in a hotel room, you better, you better believe that the, uh, the push is on, but buy beware. Does that answer your question, Gavin? Yeah, that's that's uh, good, Chris. That's one of the things we come across a lot is um, the demand for quick responses. But realistically, um, to get to the right solution, you have to know what the problem was and then what the solution for that is. And that does take a bit of time. Yeah, absolutely. If, if we're going to go off a second time on this project, you better believe we want to do it in the right direction. So, you know, if you need jerk react, that might not happen. That's more likely not to happen. And then you're really in, in the doo-doo. Every um, trade has a chance to go back and fix their work one time. Um, that's that's law, construction law in BC is my understanding. 
how it is across the rest of the world is, uh, you know, you just have to do the investigation yourselves, but uh, uh, it's fair, mistakes happen. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so please unmute yourselves and ask questions if, if something comes up. Let's have topical feedback on this stuff. Hey, Chris, Jordan here. Hey, Jordan. Do you have that chart handy for solid wood? Not, but no, you, you'd have to go back to ANSI and, and either buy it off of them or I don't know how I got hold of that one. So I've had okay. it for a while. Yeah, I've got a claim on a floor that the manufacturer, a major Canadian distributor is denying. And I, I measured probably 20 to 30 uh, 0 0.04, 0 0.05 instances of overwood. And they told me their mill allowance was 0.75 for acceptable overwood. So I went back and I found four that were over 0.8 with a caliper and everything. And I'm, I'm kind of battling through that one. So I, I, I've been taking their word for it that that 0.75 millimeter is an industry standard. But if the thing for 0.33 on it engineered is true, I need to look deeper into this. Yeah. Well, it, like toe stubbers, I, I, three quarters of a millimeter is a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had the rep on this particular job said, no, 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 that's that's acceptable. Um, if you talk to the NWFA, it's one eighth of an inch of wood is fine. And I'm like, what? Are you in the right industry? But is that left over from some sand on site standard where theoretically you could just grind that down? But that shouldn't be, that let me shouldn't just, be anywhere close to acceptable on a pre-finished product. Let, let me just clarify that that was... Uh, not acceptable and NWFA if you cross-reference their standard uh, that I just looked at through ANSI it's exactly the same so there is some consistency in the industry now when you get into pre-finished solid wood flooring um, I don't know that there's too many uh, third-party guidelines it, uh, the industry is for years and I, I'm not you know, correct me anybody out there if, if this is wrong but it's pretty much the manufacturers that state what they are going to produce and by buying that product, you're saying you're that you're okay with that. So um, not to say that there isn't a standard, but I would go back to ANSI or NWFA and, and find out. Um, NOFMA, National Oak Flooring Manufacturers Association, deal with grading and, and, uh, uh, and standards for unfinished lumber. Um, and there's the MFMA, Maple Flooring Manufacturers Association out of the US. They'll deal with maple. So, yeah, I've uh, got a couple of chats popped up here. Did the overwood issue get blamed on the installer for putting it in? Or did the mill take it on the chin? The mill took it on the chin when we established that that standard I pointed out had not been met, but it took a bit of back and forth. Um, NFCA resource manual is available to members as an online resource. It's not just a binder. Yes, that is true. The binder now, the hard copy, which is served us for the last 30 years is now gone uh, it's all a website online um, www.floorcoveringreferencemanual.com anybody can get access for it for a small fee 400 bucks gets you access and uh, uh, if you need to find something in that manual you call me and i'll get you there i'll save you uh, pouring through the many pages um, but wow, like as a flooring, I wish I'd had that manual active when I was going through uh, uh, my contracting years. I got my ass kicked around the block so many times and I, I could have protected myself and pushed back uh, very intelligently, logically, um, fairly with use of that of that language that's in that book. So any questions about that, reach out to me and I'll, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. My team includes the... There are the scopes of work defined in that manual on every commercial bid that we do and lots of larger profile residential ones. And it gives us a real starting point when things go south to have a conversation about what we're willing to help with and about what we're clearly not responsible for from the outset. It's saved our butts many, many times. Nice. Nice. That's what it's there for. Okay. Responding to a complaint. So, you know, I, I went, I had my challenges, very uh, difficult time in my working life. I've got to say it was, it was a tough job. I, I don't underestimate the uh, challenges of being constantly complained at. And, and these are not easy fixes and they involve thousands of dollars and they involve people being out of their homes. It's a, a pretty bad fuel mix. 
So I had to sort of look at what I was doing and, and force myself to see it as an opportunity. Um, this is an opportunity for my company to differentiate because I know ABC floors down the road, they're not doing this. They're not putting aside money, skimming a little bit off of every sale to build something that we at the time called a repair account. And so we had some money to offer a real warranty. Uh, we managed it very carefully, but uh, that uh, allowed us to service. And we are in the service industry. So when the homeowner said jump, kind of we said how high. And with uh, with repairs, it was all about getting ahead of the wave. I would phone back within 24 hours, not 48 hours, to make sure Mrs. Jones, who held $10,000 worth of our money, um, knew that she was of value to us and that we cared and that we were trying to do something about it. And I think over the, the course of the complaint, typically we would appeal to her reasonable side, her human side. We're all human beings. We all know that we, we're all customers at some point out there and on the, on the, on the receiving end of this <clears throat> at some level. So if you can reach that, uh, that uh, human side of the customer by showing you care and that you're sprinting, not just running, then you stand a chance of getting a second bite of the apple and getting paid. So opportunity it is. So I want to ask some of the, uh, you know, Gavin, you just piped up, friend. Thank you for that. Does, does your company have a written policy on how your reps should manage complaints? When that complaint comes in from the dealer or the homeowner or whoever, what do they do? What do they expect? Just make it up on their own or is there some kind of guide? Uh, definitely a guide and definitely following your earlier guidelines of there to um, just get the facts as they, as they were presented, not to make any judgments or decisions or promises. And then we go down the process of um, if the product needs testing, if, if it's an installation issue, we think. And that's when we connect with people such as yourself and others just to uh, see which avenue to go down first, but definitely a written policy. All right. Good to hear. I mean, uh, tell all of your reps and any of the reps that are on the call, sometimes you're being recorded. These are hostile situations sometimes. You know how hot and heavy it can get. I've been recorded as an inspector and, and in our terms and conditions, it says no recording devices except for those owned and operated by the inspector because they're trying to catch you um, assigning blame before you really know who that might be. And in many cases, uh, post-installation inspections, which are after the fact when everything's gone south, are you know the, the result, the determination is cannot give definitive conclusions because don't have a crystal ball, don't have a time machine, can't see under the floor. We're not going to uh, deliver destructive testing. Um, and so, but we give the, we basically can represent the facts because we're independent. We're just there to observe and report. So we just detail the facts. Now everybody can at least believe those. But we don't necessarily always deliver conclusions. So let's go through some of these. Um, the sales reps role. I mean, I've just put some uh, some suggestions here. Um, so, who does go to site and when? Is it the sales rep? Um, is the uh, is the dealer expected to just call the manufacturer's rep? Not go to the site themselves. A complaint generated by one of their customers, and yet they just say, "Rep, go to the site. I can't be there. I'm busy. Let me know what happens." That is, uh, in my opinion, that's an absolute no-no, unless there are extenuating circumstances. <clears throat> We've established sales reps are um, not technical reps. You know, if you're dealing with manufacturers who don't have technical reps, don't deal with them. You should have good support that understands the product better than anybody. And a technical rep uh, will do. They deal with this stuff uh, with their specifically to their flooring all the time. Um, Sales reps and account managers in any policy should be clearly uh, not expected to de deliver answers or conclusions. Sales reps should, in my opinion, it's the service side of the stick, um, should be making the client feel heard and like they matter. It's your client, you signed them up, you took their money. They look to you to uh, uh, let them know what's going on. And so, you know, it comes with the territory, part of your sale is the uh, after sales service. Part of your commission should pay for you to deal with that. Uh, it's inevitable in some cases. Carpet, very little. Hardwood, certainly site finished just about every time. Um, 
Um, but yeah, I think you, you know where I'm going with that. And, and obviously, like Gavin said, gather the facts. We'll look at some of those facts that I've listed off here in a, in a few minutes. And Chris, sorry, yeah. just to t touch a little more on that, is the consumer has a contract with the flooring dealer, not us. Um, so that yeah. initial relationship should be determined from the dealer rep to say, to look at, it. is there possibly a potential product failure or is it just insulation, which we look after? Once they've established that first visual themselves, they can call us and we'll react as soon as possible to go together with the consumer so that there is nothing misrepresented uh, from one or the other, the consumer that can then use trying to uh, push their agenda. So yeah. I thought I'd just touch, touch base on that. It's great, great info. Go together is not is the is the best approach. Um, you know, I should sort of underline the fact that installers, you should tell your installers, for example, when minimum industry standards, NFCA floor covering reference manual gets put into the documents. This is just representing competency in flooring. Um, the installer has a very clear instruction that becomes specification uh, specified. Um, do not proceed with the flooring installation if any conditions are identified that might be detrimental to the finished product. Um, stop and issue written advice to the general contractor, the owner, whoever is involved. You know, that saying in construction, if it's not written down, it did not happen. So write it down. A text counts, an email counts, and a written note counts. <clears throat> if you don't have that in, in writing in six months' time, no one will remember what's gone on. Only thing that will be remembered is uh, we're still not paid, and the uh, the client hates us. So <clears throat> uh, make sure your, your installers understand that. That's what this guy, uh, uh, on the, the example I showed you, he did. He pulled the trigger and, and stopped and uh, saved everybody a lot of wasted money. Any questions about that? Any experiences out there? Okay, so what to do is another one. What do we got here? What to do before, during, and after the complaint. Um, number one, before, you're, before you go, if you get the phone call, your job is just to placate an angry client, is just to hear them out, um, uh, you know, listen and acknowledge just, yeah, okay, that sounds terrible. Yeah, wow, that's serious. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be out there on Wednesday. Well, it sounds sort of obvious to say, but um, uh, unless you've got policy written down, it's not necessarily what's going to be done. And interestingly, I learned uh, recently that the word listen, which is what's required here, if you rearrange all the letters, you get the word silent. So there's a little tip for you. You can't listen unless you're being silent. Um. Yeah, within 48 hours is reasonable. I mean, that was actually back in the day, but today, uh, you know, with communication, email, text, off the scale compared to when uh, us older folks grew up, um, I think within 24 hours is the expectation. Otherwise, you start to annoy whoever is complaining. And the longer you annoy them, the longer you leave it, the harder that concrete sets up around the money. Let me tell you, it's going to be harder if you justify their complaint in any way beyond what has gone wrong with the floor, they will not pay you. They will take money off the bill, um, the likelihood is. So get ahead of the wave. And so that's within 24 hours. Show you're keen to deal with the problem. Over undo your errors is another great saying. Uh, follow up afterwards. No one likes to follow up on a complaint because, you know, yeah. hi, Mrs. Jones, uh, how's the floor look after our repairs? Well, there's another three boards have popped up or there's another wrinkle or something. So tendency is to not follow up it's a missed opportunity you know if another three boards have popped up then you're going to go back anyway but just show keen show that you're human we all have these sort of things to deal with and even homeowners do understand that or assume that they do <clears throat> not all of them do some of them are just downright difficult but uh, you know hopefully they're among the the, the fewer um what not to do I think Gavin, you just pointed that out. Do not guess and do not offer opinion. If you're the sales rep and you're on site and you don't know, then you're just going to say, I'm here to gather the evidence, Mrs. Jones. Um, uh, also, do not lift or break flooring or any part of the flooring without explicit approval in written uh, uh, format, not just uh, uh, verbal for the reasons I just mentioned. 
Destructive testing can come, come back to, to bite you if you damage that floor. So, <clears throat> um, I've, I've put down here, uh, what not to do, don't ask how they maintain the floor, which is actually quite interesting. As a dealer myself years ago, I remember dealing with some of the complaints and one of the first mistakes I made as I learned how to handle these things was um, don't ask have they how do they maintain the floor and it's funny because you know if, if you're dealing with wood flooring it's it's quite often the cause of the complaint if you ask that too early then you're just seen immediately as trying to uh, uh, transfer the blame back onto them if the situation lends itself to this where you know that you're going to get a third party inspector or you're going to get a tech rep out who has is less involved one step more re uh, removed from you you don't have that relationship or the tech rep doesn't um, they can ask that question uh, and I'll give you an example like uh, recently I was on a site I've done this many times <clears throat> um, go through I'm, I'm the independent inspector it's a nasty complaint the homeowner is very annoyed and uh, I go to site I, I gather all my um, data I tell them I'm not here to give you conclusions or answer just show me your issues and I'm, I'm going to take photographs and whatnot. And as I'm walking away, I'm done. I'm walking away. I will turn around and go, oh, right. Kind of like Columbo. Remember Columbo back in the day? He'd always turn around and he'd go, by the way, how do you maintain the floor? And by then you've been chatting with them and their guard is down and you get the truth when it comes to maintenance. And boy, I tell you, it's uh, very interesting. <clears throat> the one I just went through was on the request for inspection form. It had one type of maintenance. And uh, when I asked the homeowner, completely different and 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 very telling. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Columbo, that's what that's what he used to do, right? <clears throat> OK, any questions about that? No, nope. good. Uh, gather facts, report back to your technical department. Here are I've listed off these as uh, what I think uh, a salesperson could actually address. Um, on site um, and again you know there's there's uh, hundreds of different scenarios here different flooring types everything's different so um, uh, is there any material left over some call it attic stock um, very important very useful you can now photograph the end of the pack and get all the specs the die lot um, the dealer we encourage dealers to create and we've, we've got a copy if you want one create a, an installer's installation checklist <clears throat> once they check off and write and sign on the bottom of that document that they have relative humidity at between 35 and 55 the temperature is at this that and the other and it meets the manufacturer's guidelines that's that's powerful that's um influential um yeah sure they can lie about it but uh you know i think in most cases especially when people are writing it down and signing their name they tend to tell the truth um, but we encourage dealers to have those so the sales rep can ask, do you have an installation checklist? Take good photos. As you saw, the photo I took of that wood floor, it's a good photo. It's easy with smartphone technology and, you know, the cameras and the audio equipment that's built into these little uh, smartphones. It's amazing. Um, and, a, you know, photo is a thousand words. A video is like 10,000. What is beneath the floor? There's an obvious one. Is it an enclosed basement? Is it a crawl space? Is it a carport? What's beneath? And is it affecting the uh, the situation potentially? Longest unbroken run. Um, I got a picture of one actually coming up, a, a quick video actually, uh, which was around 70 feet unbroken um, and the floor had expanded. So I think the industry standard is around 35 to 40 feet. Manufacturers sometimes will mention this in their guidelines. Don't lay the floor longer than 40 feet without an expansion joint built in. Um, causes a lot of confusion because who the heck wants a speed bump right in the middle of the floor? But if you address that issue, maybe you just um, build your expansion gaps in at the ends of those, uh, uh, at the end of the property on either side a little bit more to accommodate. But if you don't think about that and you just leave a standard expansion gap on either side of the building and nothing in between, potential is for uh, expansion related problems. You can ask what the heating system is. You can photograph the thermostat um, if it's an electronic one, you'll see the uh, the dial. It says 20 degrees, maybe. Um, measure the length and the width of the product and measure the gap. 
actually inspectors are more interested in measuring the length and the width of the product to see if there's been any dimensional uh, uh, change. Um, now, you may not have a tape measure, in which case this just doesn't apply if you're a sales rep. Record creaks by walking on the floor and, and uh, using your audio equipment built into your smartphone. I've got an example of that coming up. Uh, are there any obvious tight or binding spots? Um, give you an example of that in a minute. Does the floor deflect? Deflect means bounce up and down floating floors. You know, you've got two high points, um, six feet apart, and the floor's bouncing in between. That's called deflection. And so you might not be able to measure the deflection, but you will be able to say, yeah, it's deflecting. Seems like it's a lot. That means could be a subfloor issue, a flatness issue. Kitchen cabinets should not rest. Heavy kitchen cabinets should not rest on a floating floor. Um, and other sources of weight, like pool tables, or uh, you know, it's normally a combination of these things that add up to uh, restricting a floating floor from doing what it has to do, which is shrink and expand laterally. If you block that process, you're going to have issues. Um, check bifold doors and how they're anchored to the floor. I'll show you that in a minute. Check transitions. Um, installers love to use too much adhesive, and you can see it that PL400 squirting out the side of that. Uh, T cap. It tells you that, that all they've managed to do is bind the floor and the T cap and the concrete uh, subfloor or whatever's beneath potentially uh, to each other so that there's now um, not free movement if it's a floating floor. Is, the, is it a subfloor flatness issue? You can look at the baseboards along the side. Sometimes that might give something away. Doesn't determine that it is not flat, but it might identify roll because the, uh, the baseboards won't, um, they won't bend like this. So you you tend to see gaps under them if the subfloor is not flat. And ask good questions. When was the material delivered? What was the install start and finish date? You need to gather all this obvious uh, data. Your tech reps are gonna want all this information. When was the problem first noted? How many people live in the home? Do they leave their shoes on? Uh, you know, bare feet even cause moisture issues with some hardwood floor finishes. It's just, it's all about the moisture and of course, pets. So you can take a screenshot of that or come back and look at the recorded video later on for uh, if you have a policy and it needs to be fattened up with uh, some of this content. Any questions about that? Any additional items, stuff that I've missed? Uh, yes. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, here. Just the, the one thing i like to just emphasize that very first point about material left over, every consumer should be sold an extra box or a bit of carpet for either repairs or for testing. It's one of the biggest slow, slowdowns we have in testing is if we need to test the product, it's all been installed and they can't give us something to do. So to protect everybody, uh, every dealer should sell a little extra to the consumer, either warranty protection or repairs. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Richies. Yes. Uh, so um, I go through a lot of claims on a daily basis. Um, just something that I, I kind of got used to the first few things I, I go in the house, I kind of see is, you know, uh, baseboards. I always carry my business cards with me. And that's one thing I've learned from a couple of the reps is, you know, always carry a business card and slide those under your uh, baseboards. A lot of times you get, it's too tight, uh, expansion gaps. There's another good thing is, uh, we're running into a lot of issues as the baseboards are, uh, a lot of people have those thin baseboards and a lot of our product require an expansion gap greater than what the baseboards are there now. Um, so we do have a lot of people that don't leave that exp expansion gap big enough because they want to make sure that the baseboard covers that. And then you get the issue where the, the flooring, especially us here in New Brunswick, our, our climate is very, it goes from one extreme to the other. So we get a lot of movements in the houses. Um, so those are biggest issues we have is, is, uh, areas being too tight or humidity. Yep. hundred percent and expansion. <clears throat> once that flooring, whether it's laminate wood flooring, um, SPC, once it binds and you get all that pressure sent into the field of the floor and it affects the joints, you've got potentially, you've got uh, some nasty problems coming. Yeah. Um, so we are getting close to the hour. I mean, it's crazy how fast time goes. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through some of this, but uh, if you have an interest in an inspection, reach out to us. I've talked about inspection, so I won't go on about that. Uh, 
Uh, Chris, um, just to just to make a note that Amanda Jerry um uh, asked if anyone can share their written policy with her. So perhaps uh someone can do that in the chat box. Yeah, yeah for sure. Just make a note of that, Lee, and we'll we'll get her in touch with the right people. So any pet peeves out there, like the, from the dealer? I mean, I know as, as a dealer myself, a pet peeve would be samples are not accurate or samples weren't there when I needed them. And so I ended up going to an appointment without a sample and tried to explain how the floor would look. Big mistake. <clears throat> any any dealer want to uh, offer up a pet peeve about what causes them complaints? Jordan. Hey, uh sales reps are people sent from manufacturers to do inspections who don't have a clue what they're looking at uh or or postulate denials based on unprovable things uh even that richie mentioned the business card thing that one drives me nuts because uh very few baseboards have a gap and even if you even if you can slide a piece of wax paper uh, that would indicate that that spot on the baseboard is showing no pressure whatsoever. And even if you couldn't put the piece of wax paper, all you've proved is that you can't put a piece of wax paper in there because it's touching. It doesn't imply that there's one pound of pressure on that spot. Yeah. Anyway. I hear you. I hear you. Any, any manufacturers um, got a pet peeve? So I would sum that up in um, denials based on principles that may apply in general but not necessarily in particular to the problem in that situation. Right, hence don't offer up opinion. Um, very important. Otherwise you just you set a fire burning, which is very hard to put out. Um, any manufacturers got a pet peeve? The DIY people that comes in and uh, YouTube, Google, they know everything when they walk in the store and um, a lot of my salespeople are run into these issues where they're trying to explain uh, insulation or certain specification of certain product. And uh, you do get some people that kind of did some homework on their own and they are set on uh, certain criteria on certain floor that isn't really always true and makes it a little hard for some of the salespeople. Absolutely. I think I can uh, speak for the builder uh, their pet peeve is delays. They're all about deadline. Um, homeowner, all about have my expectations been met? Did the salesperson tell the truth and set my expectations right? Because if you set them right, it all goes well. If they're set wrong, look out. Um, common causes. I think we're going to fire through that and we're going to look at some real life examples. So sampling. I worked for a distributor for five years and uh, was that manufacturer's rep. And I was just, I got so annoyed with them. We had a, we had a bloodbath of a meeting one time when my client uh, phoned to complain to me that we had this floor over here, all this character. And yet the sample I'd issued was this because that was a sample that was made by the manufacturer. So I, my company had set the, uh, the ball rolling off in the wrong direction. Same with Acacia, you know, who wants, sap wood in their floor if you've got this on the sample it's a big deal especially in wood flooring carpet not so much um you know uh, samples are more like samples like this explain color very well but they don't uh explain grading critical um this sample was great <clears throat> this uh, we had an angry customer on this this job uh, saying that uh, the two boards above the sample weren't representative and therefore the floor should be removed and um I was able to, as an inspector, show them that on the back of this sample, there was a, a clear guidance. Uh, not all boards will be the same color. And there was actually a, a QR code that took you to a website with a very, very representative picture, color uh, and uh, color variation across the floor. It looked exactly like the floor. And so I was prepared to rule that this was acceptable because um, buyer beware. If the homeowner is going to go out there and buy materials for their renovation, they become the designer, they become the design authority, and it's up to them to do the research. So if they haven't, they can't complain about it later. Um, sales, critical, the ball goes off in the wrong direction, um, then all hell is going to break loose. And I know this job went to hell because this is actually one of my jobs that I sold 
one of the first ones that I, I made a real mess up of, <clears throat> the, the uh, poor installer. All this concrete down here is, is um, leveling compound. So how do you, with all this junk in the way, because I didn't manage this part of the sale, how do you do that? How do you pour concrete with all this stuff in the way? And his poured right across. <clears throat> the guy's a magician. And that cost me a lot of Tim Horton's coffee and donuts, let me tell you, for the next three weeks while we tried to placate the installers and get them to do the job. So um, if the homeowner had been around and been subject to seeing this and been in, on site when the installers were there bitching and complaining about it, it would have gone very badly. But fortunately, the uh, uh, homeowner was not home. So we got to just tidy it up. Wrong spec. <clears throat> no idea of what was the floor was going to be used for, that it was going to be aggressively treated. And so within uh, short, uh, no time at all, it's just completely destroyed the floor. Um, preparation. This, if you see this on site, it's most likely an acclimation issue. The flooring has been brought in cold into a warm environment, installed too quickly, and now it's expanded and it's pushing against itself and it peaks up. Um, there are a variety of reasons, but in my opinion, uh, in my experience, it's mostly poor acclimation. Of, this is LVT, luxury vinyl tile. Um, poor prep. Think of uh, resilient flooring vinyl as just a skin that's going to go and over top of the substrate and show every deviation, every imperfection. Um, and so you've got to prep that floor properly. Contaminants must be removed, even uh, uh, drawings. This is drawing of the HVAC system by the uh, mechanical people, which bled through the resilient floor. Um, took a few months, I guess, to do that. <clears throat> but now what are you going to do? It had to be ripped out and replaced. Fast track construction is maybe to blame there. Uh, cutting corners when it can, because it's trying to meet a deadline and avoid a penalty clause, maybe. Old adhesive must be removed. If you don't remove it, who knows whether the new adhesive is going to react with the old adhesive and give you random spots like this. So a uh, contractor had tried to remove the adhesive and gave up close to the door. And we, as the inspection service, we just identified this is not good enough. And the uh, uh, contractor went back in and, and did the right job. So we avoided this. SPC, this is a video installed over top of a non-flat substrate. I'm sure you can see, it's just broken. This is in a kitchen galley. Lots of focused, heavy traffic in that area, and the product has just completely fallen apart because it was deflecting. You can see here it's cracked. Uh, you know, there must be, if we pulled that floor out, you'd see a, a small low spot there. And as a result, squeaks, deflection, broken joints, voided warranty, unhappy clients. Wood flooring very quickly because there are wood substrates out there. If you are installing resilient flooring, over a wood substrate. Uh, do not use any of these unless you find something like chipboard, maybe uh, stamped as under as flooring underlayment grade. Uh, most are not. Oriented strand board is not, not. Hardboard is not. You want to buy purpose-made uh, flooring underlayment with a uh, fastener schedule stamped onto the face of it like this. So if you're a contractor, it's your responsible. Uh, the general contractor's job is to lay it's to create the substrate by laying the flooring underlayment grade plywood, quarter inch thick. And uh, those staples add up to a total of, I think it's 386 staples you have to put into, uh, yeah, total of 386 staples, not just one or two staples to hold down the, uh, the product. It's like a serious uh, uh, deal. Any questions about that? That's the result. Uh, on a one job where the staple and not, not enough, like they had floor, floor grade underlayment down, but they didn't staple it enough. And so it buckled. So you had these lines that sort of chatter across the floor. That's a, a luxury vinyl plank telegraphed right through. New adhesive application. It's, uh, you know, adhesives work very well if you follow the instructions. Um, many uh, material manufacturers are saying only use this adhesive with our product because the back of the uh, product is designed to work with the adhesive. When we look at this, you'll see the ribbed or the um, textured backing. Not all adhesives uh, will work with that necessarily. Sometimes it's an absolutely smooth backing. Not all adhesives will work with a smooth backing. 
So be very careful when you start to switch out adhesive or using a, a universal adhesive. You've really got to make sure it's going to work with the manufacturer's LVT, not just LVT or whatever it is you're putting down. Um, we'll make this the last section because we're going to go over the hour. Um, but this is a, an example of um, uh, expansion and what a disaster it can be. This is a wood floor uh, on one side of the building, 70 feet long, entirely open space, ground level of a three-story house. Um, you can see the marble in the bathroom on one side of the ground level is tight. And it was the exact same on the other side of the home, 70 feet away, tight. So this floor is uh, engineered, I think it was like five or six inch wide, um, and it had expanded. It was new construction. Um, moisture comes into new construction and makes things swell. And so this was the result. Uh, this is the homeowner dancing around on her floor. Um, the, the main floor was 2,500 square feet. And the result was it all got ripped out and done again because no expansion gap. This is uh, uh, nailed to plywood. Okay, I think you get the point there. One more of these. Um, if you want to know if the installer has installed with enough nails, go get yourself some rare earth magnets from a hardware store. Um, just if you can see my cursor moving around by the area rug at the bottom of the screen, there you can see one of my magnets. And I've, I've, the magnets found a staple holding this, this nail down uh, wood floor, engineered wood floor down. And I've just marked that with a torn off piece of post-it note. And you can see everywhere I've identified a nail. Now, the nail schedule should be a nail here, a nail here, a nail here, a nail here, every six to eight inches. And within three inches of the end of every board. And you can see when we got to here, absolutely no staples for two rows. And then when the third row kicks in here, nothing here, there, there, there. So what happened with this floor was it sounded like this. I don't know that the audio is coming through, Chris. Uh, it is at the end there. So when you moved into other parts of the um, the home, the nailing, sch nailing schedule improved and the creaks went away. Um, did anybody not hear that? That was the audio. No, I couldn't hear it. No audio. Uh, not on the last video either. Oh, really? Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Well, take it from me. It's like Rice Krispies are underneath there. I tell you, it's just brutal. And those floors... I uh, had to come out at great expense. Um, islands, this is all granite or something equally heavy on the floating floor. Floating engineered floors should not gap if they are installed properly. So if you see this, there's either not enough glue in there or uh, something happened uh, in the installation process. It may be that the manufacturer's tongue and groove is, is so loose that it comes apart, but the adhesive, makes the joint swell and makes it tight and it bonds. It shouldn't gap. And closet hardware. So there's a bifold door. And what I do, uh, well, you're not gonna be able to hear this, but uh, I will, this is the floating floor, which we don't want this to anchor the floating floor to the, the subfloor. So what I'll do as an inspector, I'll come and knock on the floor all the way up to the bracket and I tell you, nine times out of 10, it is hollow in the field of the floor. And it is like a dull thud, like it's glued down all the way around that bracket. It tells you something. Does that make sense? And how many closet doors, bifold doors have at least two of these brackets? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of pinch points built into the floor at that point. Um, got some more questions here. I like 
to spec color match silicon to use as transitions like the Schluter one for an expansion joint. Yes. Um, yes, we have that too. We always tell customers that recommend an extra box for future purposes. Yeah, the same attic stock is recommended. Uh, this complaint was, um, everyone thought this was a, a non-flat substrate. So when we play this, there's the homeowner stepping on the floor and you can see the rock, the chair becomes a rocking chair. Well, it turned out to be expansion. The floor had just buckled up a little bit. Um, the floor, subfloor was dead flat, but the expansion joint um, aspect had not been honored. Chris, I saw one recently like that where we were expecting to have to do some massive substrate uh, repairs. And when we opened it up, the other installers had multi-layered foam, overlapped their foam edges. And there were a couple like chunks of little chips of OSB and wood under there. The floor was actually fine, but we had issues like that causing joint failures because there's just crud under the floor and the oh. pad is overlapped. Right, cleanliness, just right. It was a happy day for a customer who was expecting a $10,000 prep bill and we were out of there in a day. No doubt. Well, listen, for those on the call, I know we've set aside an hour for this, so maybe your schedules don't allow for you to stay on. You can catch this, the rest of this present. I'll, I'll keep going and we'll record this and we'll load it up so you can watch it any time rather than me just sort of speed through and, and devalue the presentation. So if you want to jump off, carry on. If you can, if you have time to stay on, we'd love to have you stay on. Um, but I'll just keep plowing. Um, carpet, <clears throat> one of the most common things we see out there is lack of seam sealer to, to uh, reseal cut edges. And this next picture is a close-up, a magnifying glass of a cut edge um, that you can see here is a very clean cut. Floors, uh, the carpet's been put back together very well, but no seam sealer binding this. So all these loops just roll right off. Uh, and the problem with this floor was they were dragging chairs. Uh, lots of dinners took place here and they were dragging chairs across the seams. And very quickly, we started to see this sort of thing. Within, you know, within the year, it started to look like a, uh, you know, the, well, it was ready for replacement. So terrible. Wrinkles in carpet. Talk to pretty much any manufacturer that deals with uh, Broadloom and they'll tell you it needs to be, if it's going to be stretched in, you've got to stretch it in with a power stretcher. But these aren't used very often out there. Um, but all the standards say to use them. CRI 104, 105 say to use them. NFCA's manual says to use them. Um, and the manufacturers do as well. So if you don't, you're rolling the dice. You're taking it on yourselves to install the carpet incorrectly. Any questions about that? Okay. Maintenance. Oh, boy, do we ever see a lot of problems? This is a perfectly good um, rubber floor installed in a school uh, up in northern BC, I think this was. And uh, day after installation, janitors move in with the wrong pad and scratch the entire thing. And now what? Damp mopping wood floors. Um, a maximum of once a month, maybe. I, you know, my wood floor, I never damp mopped it. I would just uh, clean it locally uh, where, ne where needed. Um, beware Swiffer wet jet um, uh, towels because they just they soak the floor. And if you if you have a regime of doing that once a week, you've soaked the floor fifty two times in one year, and you will get this. The floor will fail. Some manufacturers make their finish more resistant than others. It's about how deep the sealer goes into those brushed fissures and cavities. If the manufacturer doesn't attend to getting sealer deep into those fissures and cavities, then moisture can get underneath the finish easier and push the finish off the floor. It flakes off and then unprotected wood quickly turns charcoal gray and you've got a complaint on your hands. So, you know, you should really, as a manufacturer, you should absolutely know whether your wood floor is appropriate in a kitchen scenario because they are wet, they are moist. It's not about spilt water, it's just about humidity and moisture. And uh, 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 it can be very destructive over time. Oiled floors in the world of hardwood, this area in the middle, which looks kind of boring and bland, that's the original color of the floor. Everything around it is the dirt that has built up in the floor, um, highlighting all the soft grains. 
And so what had happened here is the homeowners cleaned all around where I, I pulled the sofa back from this one so you could see underneath the sofa and uh, you know very quickly it became obvious that the maintenance was the issue here. Um, and when I said, when I was, as I was leaving the home, I turned around and I said, oh, by the way, what do you clean the floor with? And out popped the wet jet uh, Swiffer. So funny how that works. Maintenance for UV cured urethane finish. There are industry standards, basic. I mean, always follow the manufacturer's standards, number one. We always, are, our, our industry standards defer to the manufacturer of whatever product's being used. Um, so you daily sweep or dust mop, you weekly vacuum, and at, at the most uh, monthly would you damp mop. But it's always better to dry mop. And oil finish, uh, uh, you know, you follow the regular maintenance, but if you see uh, wear and tear, like I just showed you in that picture, you know that the complaint is likely to be maintenance uh, driven. So many problems in the world of hardwood with uh, uh, legs and the protection on those legs. Factories produce these nylon buttons that go on the bottom of most legs out there and they will destroy your floor pretty quick for finish anyway. Casters should have those uh, uh, plastic see-through mats. Any caster doing this, the, the office chair thing, will wear the floor out within uh, within a year. Uh, felt glides should be cleaned because they accumulate hair and dust and debris. Hair is uh, extremely abrasive, unusually abrasive. So if you have clumps of hair underneath the uh, felt glides on your chair legs, you've got a problem coming. Clean them. In this case, the homeowner was complaining about scratches or scuffs in her LVT, this is an SPC floor. Um, why were they developing? I thought this floor was bulletproof. And uh, when you picked the, the chair up and looked underneath at the felt glide, that's what you saw. The felt glide had been worn down one side and now you've just got the edge of the plastic rubbing on the LVT, causing no end of scuffs. Scratches set the expectations. They all scratch hardwood flooring products. Um, laminate flooring uh, products, if you try hard enough, will scratch. Um, vinyl products will scratch as well um, at different rates. Compression scratch is no different. Dogs, I mean, we can tell here that this is not installation related. One of those scratches crosses multiple board, boards. Uh, it's more likely to be um, post installation. A couple of manufacturing examples of where we have a failure. Um, this floor, uh, this divot was identified, thought originally that it was maybe a rolling load had rolled over the floor while the adhesive was still wet. Um, but you can see it stops at the next piece of flooring, it doesn't continue. So it was obviously in the flooring piece. Um, great manufacturer in this case, they were called, they came and assessed and they said, yep, that's us, we'll deal with that. And they replaced it in short order. Um, just nice to see that it happens, and uh, you know, it's fair and logical uh, uh, <clears throat> process and result. SPC, you know, why would it, an SPC floor do that? We expect wood flooring to do that when it's installed over wet subfloor. But SPC, it's supposed to be waterproof, isn't it? It's supposed to be good for temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius and below minus 60. Um, but you know what? I don't think it is. From my experience out there, it's just not. So be very careful when you sell these products. In this case, what happened, uh, this is all over radiant heat. And so that the homeowner had left the heat on and the, the difference in the heat beneath and above caused um, a change in shape. There was no moisture involved, it's all dry. SPC, uh, this is one of the biggest problems I think out there in the world of flooring right now. Um, this telltale break along the butt end of every piece or well, most pieces in high traffic areas, about three months after installation is finished, these start to show up and it can be one of a few different reasons. Maybe the subfloor isn't flat, maybe the installer, in, uh, installed the product, fit it together wrong, so it broke the joint just a little bit, and that joint worked its way into a 
much more uh, uh, pronounced break later on. You can't see when you're installing necessarily. Maybe it came from the factory with a fracture in the uh, um, at the end there, the end joint. Um, and yeah, and then possibly use and abuse. That's always possible. But I did want to share with you an interesting photograph, which takes a cross section of an SPC joint. And just explain to you that this is where it breaks right here, if you can see my cursor. And so all that pressure, if your foot falls right here, it's going to work it over time. And so it really behooves anyone who's going to sell this and install it to have a, a, a dead flat substrate. If you don't, this is going to, this is like uh, one millimeter thick. I mean, how is that ever going to withstand um, use and abuse and, and, and function as a floor? So think about that. Um, substrates absolutely have to be flat. Mr. and Mrs. Jones don't necessarily want to spend two bucks on their floor covering and six dollars on their substrate. Um, so quite often we see substrate uh, preparation uh, corners cut and then the problems follow in the floor covering. So that brings my slideshow to an end. Any questions? Thanks for uh, staying with us.